An episode ago, I talked about that breathtaking moment, that exciting time when I first came into contact with text-to-image AI for creating artwork and images. And it fascinated me to talk about this moment because it's so rare that something new like this has fallen into my hands. But it's the modern world. We unfortunately know the end game that comes with new technology. And as somebody who has stood at the end game of many, many aspirational technologies, I feel it would be really irresponsible to talk about how great things are without ruminating a little bit on how bad things are going to be. Here then, I put on my black angel wings and I stand at the dark times to come. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Jeff Atwood, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Every technology has a life cycle. A moment of unsteady creation, often based on previous discoveries and previous works, clumped together and considered to be its own, if not new, innovated thing. And then comes moments of trying to understand what its context is, what its potentials are for various types of sales, and then discovery of what its use, utility, and eventually exploitation and creation into a product, until finally, over time, it almost always goes south. Maybe it's something as simple as an acquisition by a firm or a group that have different priorities about that product. Maybe it's the advance of society or the needs of businesses and individuals such that that tool, as it was currently minted, doesn't support itself and it simply becomes a subset or a forgotten branch of a progression. Maybe also people start to look at the ramifications of what this tool does and attempt in some way to shift its path, its pattern, make it illegal, make it not the preferred way of doing business. Something as simple as the personality or actions of a company or CEO can cause a product to lose its desirability and its use as the ecosystem, the support network around it, fades and moves away. All of these stories represent the passage of time and technology. We can enjoy looking back with a rosy nostalgia how things were or how we tell ourselves things were, but over time, everything changes. The difference for me is that over a decade of experience watching the life cycle of products and websites tells me where things will probably go with mid-journey and other text-to-image systems. So if you don't want spoilers, especially for a technology you may not have had any chance with, maybe you want to put this episode away until a future time. But if not, here we go. As I've said before, I have very little faith in people as a whole. I don't think we often do the right thing. And so I revel, I take great joy when I see positive and great things happen. Because not only do I not expect it, I assume only the worst. Some of that is just experience in my own life and things I've witnessed, and, and some of it is unjustified negativity so that life doesn't disappoint me. But I know, even now, how many times people came together to help me or do good things in service, making life and society and people better. So while my view is dim, it is not pitch black. A technology that comes in and creates a whole new way of achieving something previously thought only the province of human beings is, by its very nature, an extraordinarily unpredictable flame. There are multiple areas of attack for looking at something like mid-journey and finding where things could possibly go wrong. 
The first and most obvious in today's society is concerning yourself with the amount of computing power it requires to do its job. At many thousands of GPUs being required, it means that it's taking a lot of electricity, a lot of power, when people are very concerned about power consumption. I can't defend that aspect of things, but I do know that we only benefit knowing about exactly what power is consumed where, by what, in what manner, and if there's efficiencies that can be enacted to make things better. Instead of shying away from that aspect, I encourage more and more study of making entities that work in power consumption justify their usage and try to find ways to be more efficient. Do that everywhere. Stand up and ask. Insist on knowing the answer. Don't rest until you know. The more difficult question consists what the role of artists and illustrators are if there is a machine that can supposedly replace them. If, in fact, Midjourney and its family of software contemporaries are going to get better, and these are just the first few halting steps of a technology, it is absolutely the case that a certain type of art and a certain kind of illustration will be able to be done automatically, almost scarily efficient in terms of generation. Being able to take the zeitgeist of an essay or a work and create an illustration that reflects what that article is talking about is within the realm of possibility. The craft of taking somebody or something's image and remixing it artistically to catch your eye before you read about or learn about what it does is within the bounds of this technology. You will be able, in some way, to quickly generate a simple or even unusually insightful version of an illustrative image. In the same way that PostScript and vector technology removed the need for a lot of drafting tools, a reasonable assumption is that this program running with people voting on what looks greatest could create a slideshow of art that would consume the rest of your life. The precipice of considering certain classes of art and illustration to only be the province of what must have been human creators was frankly passed long ago. We've been living in a world where there are industrial factories of workers creating art along very, very narrow parameters for the purposes of quick turnaround in marketplaces. For years now, people have been able to send photos of themselves, their families, or their pets, and have a person, a person they will never meet, who walks in every morning and paints until they go home at night, some version of an oil painting portrait using the photograph as the source. We have been more than happy to add an ever-growing pile of plugins and algorithms and additions to art programs to have them augment or assist us in making what we want to much faster. The fact that I personally bridged the era from which making a cutout outline of a photograph of a person to lay over another background has gone from a person, from an individual with an exacto knife, over to an algorithm that achieves a perfect cutout effect, tells me that these are the sort of things happening all the time. Instead, what we find ourselves doing is looking internally at what points in art and creation we considered off-limits, beyond the realm and the keen of machinery that only a human being would represent. I've been involved in parody and hoaxes and jokes that involved a lot of labor trying to look like something it's not, manipulated photographs and carefully shot movies to make you see something that isn't real as real. This new AI technology is just another layer of that for me. The time for realizing how much of the world is now mechanized, computerized, created using very complicated algorithms that almost have an organic feel to them has long passed us. And if this is the moment that makes you aware, then the technology has achieved even more than it intended.
The next concern, which I consider extraordinarily valid and something to be addressing already, is where these image sets come from. It is becoming trivial to take the ingestion engine of a drawing program like this and aim it everywhere at stock photos, catalogs of art, picture books, general drawing on the internet, photography sites, television, radio, and from it derive the basic bones of various concepts and terms to be used by the algorithm. At some level of scale, carefully constructed data sets that have been cleaned and vetted no longer make any sense for ingestion. Instead, you end up with a powerful incentive to look the other way while your machine feeds on fields of creativity and work and ideas to create new things of its own. My suspicion is that more forward-thinking groups will create terms of service that try to address this problem, that say taking the zeitgeist of their work and using it in some way associated with AI art is completely off the table. And as a result, I predict, we'll see the same issues that rose up around music sampling. Clear, obvious samples being taken from somewhere become negotiations, licenses, creating some sort of fee for the usage of their imagery by these services. And one or two or three or 30 high-profile lawsuits setting in various jurisdictions whether or not ingestion can just run free. I will say one thing. In my opinion, copyright as it currently stands doesn't apply here. This is a whole other realm. This is a difference between videotaping a movie and walking out of a theater and describing a plot to someone only for them to create a whole new movie from how you described things. Your level of detail dictates how similar their work was to something they never saw. That battle is coming. It'll come sooner rather than later, especially with regard to specific artists and specific celebrities for whom their image and their brand is inherently recognizable, that when you see it, you say it, and somebody somewhere will defend their ability to get paid for that action. But even beyond the integration of this technology into today's world, is the fact that new possibilities arise, which we would have never dreamed possible 10 or 15 years ago. The idea, the future, that every image and movie and video that you see will be manipulated under the hood for you specifically. That an advertising profile that has been following you all your life and knowing what gets your attention and what makes you turn away will change what you see. Imagine a world where you're reading a news article and all of the people in the illustrations look like you or are doing things that you care about to get your attention, automatically created based on what these algorithms know about you. Imagine seeing a movie or reading a comic book that's been created from scratch just for you based on a thousand other sources synthesized and presented to you as if it's completely original. Imagine people being chased to the ends of the earth because in an underground group they've been hiring folks to acquire creative works elsewhere throughout all of history and contemporary scenes to resell with the knobs turned up into something brand new. Already, people have figured out that what was called artificial intelligence in the present day is really just a layering of many different analytical algorithms taking sources of what has already been created and turning it into something that is at best, air quotes, new and more likely easily traceable to this photograph, this painting, this portion of video. But I'll also say that we've been seeing that happen in artwork all of our lives. People take events, locations, photographs, and build new works on top of them, creating a whole new derivative idea based on what they witnessed, and us looking at the whole final creation like a slurry and seeing chunks of what came before and where it came from are fine with it. 
And I will say that in contemporary interaction with these programs, people are currently becoming artists of a different stripe. While they're not putting pen to paper or sketching on a tablet to create the art, they are forming and experimenting and playing with all different sorts of text prompts, giving these machines different sentences, sentences that are meant to invoke sets of data that we otherwise wouldn't think of that way. We're used to the idea of a red sphere or a blue cube, but how do you draw an embarrassed sky? What do you exactly get when you create a devastating radio forest with the style of cyberpunk and fluorescent lights? What comes out the other end of those sentences, and what can you change to make it go in a new direction? As somebody from a family that has created art in a whole realm of mediums, I'll say that it didn't matter that it was coming out of a paintbrush, computer mouse, or a set of markers. What mattered was taking those tools and using our minds and creativity to push them in different directions, to find out what came out the other end of experimentation and then going further and further in that realm. I worked as a street caricaturist in Harvard Square in the 1990s, and it was a process, an almost industrial action, to take whoever would randomly sit in front of me and give me $5 and turn how they looked into something accurate to who they were, while also adding a spin of creativity. And some days I made something beautiful, and other days I made something. It was easy for me to stop where I was, take certain methods of pencil and cross-hatching and how I drew eyes and noses and chins, and turn it around in a relatively short period of time. But even then, I found moments, moments where instead of taking five minutes to do a drawing, I would take 10 or 11 because there was something special about the person or my feelings or the circumstances that made me want to go an extra step. And in doing so, I made discoveries I would use again and again. The times of me drawing with pen to paper are pretty much long past. An occasional sketch here or there but I found myself drifting to mediums of 3D drawing and documentary filmmaking and ultimately the moving around and creation of collections at the Internet Archive. My artisticness has lived on. Where they've ended up expressed has constantly changed. That's where we stand now, looking into how everything can go wrong. Seeing this new tool and its scary but breathtaking ramifications fall into the hands of the general public to no longer be a small set of researchers and finding what people do with them and the day-to-day -day ups and downs of discovering what comes is for me just the natural next act of the unfolding play of a creative life. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Josiah Lucher, James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Dileep Reddy, Craig Talbert, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, John Sturm, Eugene, Martin, Sembiance, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. I have one last bit to talk about this technology in my life, and that is how quickly I turned from playing around with it, a fun toy, a bizarre machine that could take anything I threw at it, and how I used it in those first few days to make a music video.